after fashioning a few acres of red earth once famously described by a rival as a bag of rusty nails into a $20 billion mining house in just eight years, Fortescue Metals boss Andrew Forrest this week announced he'd be stepping away from running the company and into the chairman's job. The change doesn't seem to have slowed the company's momentum, with incoming boss Nev Power committed to bringing forward an already ambitious target to triple production by 12 months. I spoke to Nev Power just after he'd returned from a site visit to the Pilbara with an army of investors and analysts in tow. Well, Nev Power, I heard uh, Andrew Forrest say the other day that as CEO he was spending about half his time on philanthropy. So I'm just wondering, uh, what's actually going to change in the company now that he goes to being chairman? Well, Alan, uh, Andrew, as you know, has been not only the founder but the, uh, the stalwart in the organisation and he has been the ramrod leader of, of um, Fortescue. However, there is a very, very strong senior leadership team and, uh, and team within Fortescue. And this team has been developed over the last few years and Andrew's been assembling a very strong team to pick up that leadership challenge. So while uh, he'll certainly be missed in the organisation, um, the rest of us in the team will certainly step up to the plate. So let's just talk about what you're going to do. Fortescue Metals is one product from one place to one customer. I mean, talk about all your eggs in one basket. Are you going to diversify the company? Alan, look, we are very strong believers in China and the continued growth and, and continued drive from China. However, as we expand from 55 million tonnes per annum where we are today to 155 million tonnes and beyond, we will look to diversify our customer base. However, having said that, our key customer and our key focus will remain China. Any thought of diversifying your product base? Well, um, our key focus at the moment is definitely uh, Pilbara Iron Ore. However, uh, we can afford to be opportunistic about these things and if there are really good opportunities that, that arise, then we're always open to have a look at them. Uh, we have a couple of key criteria about developing other, other opportunities. Firstly, we want to be in countries and places where we're prepared to holiday with our kids. And secondly, we want them to be opportunities equally as good as what iron ore in the Pilbara is for us. So they're reasonably high benchmarks and, and hurdles that we set, but we've certainly got an open mind to looking at other commodities if they meet those criteria. So tell us what sort of countries you'd like to go on holidays with your kids in. <laughs> well, we have a very, uh, very wide number of countries that that leaves open for us, Alan. Italy, France... Yeah, any of those, that sounds pretty good. But, uh, I mean, all of the uh, Asian countries and a lot of the uh, South American countries, a lot of the African countries are all fantastic places. But, obviously, there are some countries where we would uh, look very carefully to understand the sovereign risk and understand the safety of our people. But do you have people on your team actively looking at other opportunities? Alan, we have a very wide and diverse development group and as you can appreciate, we get a lot of opportunities that are coming in the door with people offering us um, to be part of various developments. So we are looking at those and we have at times looked at opportunities that have come up and said, well, perhaps that's going to be of interest of us. As yet, we haven't found anything that we would uh, stick our name to and want to pursue, but I think uh, as those opportunities continue, we'll inevitably find some other um, things that we'll get interested in. Well, just looking at your Pilbara operations, you're going to take the production, as you say, up to 155 million tonnes per annum. Is that it? I mean, can you go to 200 million tonnes? Yes, Alan. We, we're not only got plans to go to 155. Those plans are locked in. Um, that's a funded plan to develop to 155 million tonnes. And uh, as I uh, mentioned in the last couple of days, we now have a program for that development works which could have us as early as June 2013 for that production rate. Now, there's plenty that can go wrong in that, and uh, obviously that's very ambitious, but at this stage, that's the, uh, that's the plan we're looking at. So as soon as we've achieved 155 million tonnes, we will continue to assess what's next beyond that. And we have ambitions to get to uh, 350 million tonnes, but that will obviously depend on the market at the time and the opportunities that we have to develop that. But um, certainly we will have the resource base to do it, we will have the uh, teams and the people to do it, and we've certainly got a plan which would be to develop a new Pilbara port 
and use that to leverage our, our further expansion. And, and are the key risks in ramping it up to 155 million tonnes and beyond capital or labour or market risks? Well, Alan, uh, we've worked very hard to de-risk the 155 million tonnes. Obviously, the market is one that we can't do anything about to control directly, but we've talked uh, very carefully and closely with our customers in China, and we see China as a very strong economy continuing to go forward, developing not only the urbanisation, but uh, a further beyond that, a domestic consumption base which will drive steel demand. So we're very confident that uh, steel demand and therefore the price and demand for iron ore is going to be strong going forward. Uh, the other risks are much more within our control and we've worked very hard with our suppliers to make sure we've locked in delivery schedules. We're working with our major contractors and most of those now are getting squared away and we have a very strong culture of um, empowering our people and making sure that we've got a good team approach. So I think that lowers our risk. I could also say that we're not seeing the pinch point in demand for people right now. Um, by getting to market early with this expansion, I think we're a little ahead of the, uh, the pack and therefore we are finding that there are plenty of people around at this stage. Tony Abbott recently urged mining companies to become activists against the carbon tax. Are you going to do what he suggests? Alan, uh, the carbon tax, uh, from our point of view, is a concern. Um, it, it is potentially going to export jobs from Australia because any tax that is applied in Australia which upsets the balance in terms of competitiveness uh, and we're out there ahead of the rest of the world is going to impact on us. So we are very concerned about the carbon tax in terms of um, the fact that it will impact us rather than anyone else in the world. So you don't believe you'll get sufficient compensation? Well, obviously the details of it have been very light on to date, but um, you know, if, uh, if the past is anything to go on, I'd be surprised if we're um, well compensated for it. So what are you going to do about it, apart from write emails to Julia Gillard? Well, I think we'll certainly um, be part of any, any um, enlightened debate about it and we'll try and input and lobby and put our views to the government as strongly as we can to make sure that our voice is heard. Because, as I said before, uh, we're not opposed to tax per se, but we just want to make sure that the taxes that are imposed don't drive some unintended outcomes. Thanks very much, Nev Power. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate it.